Hurricane Maria made landfall in Puerto Rico early in the morning of September 20th. The trail of devastation it left behind made it one of the worst storms in U.S. history. But Maria did more than just uproot houses and leave tens of thousands homeless. The Category 4 storm ripped apart the social fabric of the island's 3.4 million citizens and forced them to cope with what amounted to a crisis in criminal justice. With 100% of power knocked out, an overworked police force struggled to maintain a 12-hour curfew. Today, an island already suffering from economic stress has become distrustful of a government unwilling to acknowledge an increasing death toll. Estimates now put the number of people dead from the storm to more than 1,000, seven times the official figure. Nearly four months after Maria, there are still serious challenges to public safety. Reports of crime and domestic violence are on the rise even as the island experiences an effective police walkout, with thousands of officers calling in sick to protest the lack of overtime pay. To bring us up to date and to explore the storm's long-term impact on the island's already troubled justice system, we're pleased to have William Ramirez with us today on Criminal Justice Matters. He's one of the founders and the executive director of Puerto Rico's branch of the American Civil Liberties Union and a leader in the movement for criminal justice reform on the island. We reached him at his office in San Juan through Skype. William, how are you? I'm doing fine. It's great to have you. Um, we've got you through Skype, through the internet connection that's available on the island. We know that half of the island is still without power, so we're so pleased that you're able to join us today. And our, re our viewers should know that just in case there might be glitches along the way, but it's really uh, a great honor to have you with us at Criminal Justice Matters. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And in fact, yesterday we had a major power outage again after we got our electricity back after three and a half months. So we were scared that this was going to be permanent, but we're back on the grid. And, well, bring uh, us up to date a bit on the conditions of the island right now. In December, you called uh, what was happening since Maria a human crisis. Are we still involved in a human crisis? Have things gotten better? Yes. Yes, there, there is a human crisis in Puerto Rico on many levels, and one of the major areas is healthcare. Right, uh, you have a lot of older citizens uh, that do not have access to healthcare, cannot access doctors. Doctors have left. Many doctors were leaving before, and many have left since then. Uh, hospitals, some hospitals do not have electricity, they work with generators, and so you don't have access to certain therapies. And we visited uh, patients that are bedridden in their home that have access do not have access to doctors, do not have access to medicine, um, and have no way of ha having access. And, and if it were not for some NGOs that go visit, they would probably die, and many have died. On top of that, public safety has been compromised. Public safety as well. is compromised as well. Crime is up. Um, cops, police officers are out on a slowdown uh, because they, they've not been paid. They've been, work they've been working long hours on the very bad conditions. And so a series of things contribute to this, uh, what we're calling a human crisis. But one thing that I've always said is the human crisis has been here. Uh, what Maria has done, it, it, it has unmasked something that has been brewing for a while, uh, which is related to our bankruptcy, our insolvency, and the creation of a fiscal control board that is running the country, but is not elected by other people. There's so much that we can talk about in terms of the effect and the impact on the island of that Maria left. But just to narrow it down on the whole criminal justice aspect of it, people right. were worried immediately after the storm about their personal security. There was fear sure. about safety. Is that, were they, did they have reason to fear? Are they still worried? Sure, they have reason to fear. Uh, in very much the same way that people have reason to fear in Louisiana and during, uh, during Katrina and, and New Orleans, a lot of crime, crime went up. Um, we had the same issues here. Uh, but it gets complicated because unlike Louisiana or New Orleans where you have flat land, it's plain, uh, we have mountain towns up and down the ranges, mountain ranges, uh, in very remote, very dark locations. 
-hmm. And there have been uh, bands of uh, criminals that have incurred in criminal activity. Uh, one of the common crimes that we're seeing now is uh, generators being stolen. Generators have been stolen from nursing homes, from hospitals, from businesses, and also from people's homes. So there is crime. Uh, crime has worsened. It's very dark in some of these communities. Um, there is no police protection. No police protection. Well, some of these towns are small towns. Right. They have a precinct with maybe a few police officers. Right now, police officers are on a slowdown. So some precincts weren't even opening in the past weeks because they didn't have the officers to open. Um, but also, um, the, uh, the, the, the police officers are being used at the intersections because we have no electricity at the intersections, so the lights aren't working. It's chaos when it comes down to, um, to uh, uh, the periods in which people go to work and go home. Uh, the roads are chaotic, and so cops are being used for that. But even that is not covered now because of the slowdown. And, of course, it's easy to blame the cops uh, for this situation, uh, but in reality, this has been going on for a while, and police officers do have a legitimate complaint, which is, you know, you're under the sun for 18 hours, right. in the rain, in the dark where cars are barely uh, missing you, all right? Uh, it's very stressful, and most cops in Puerto Rico go back to the same conditions as anyone else here. Police officers here are not like the police officers in New York, they buy homes in Long Island, they buy homes in Staten Island. Police officers here live in housing projects. Yeah. They live in poor barrios because they're poorly paid. And, and so they go back to the city. I mean, yeah. they've, been, they've been looking for overtime pay, or, or are they just sure, are they paying I mean, increases as well? Sure, they're working overtime, seven days a week, 18 hours a day, um, under very poor conditions, poorly equipped. So they're all stressed out. They're, they're checking out sick. So um, now... The, uh, the police department, what it's looking to do is penalize these police officers that have reported sick. And if they cannot um, uh, provide evidence that they're actually ill. So one of my, you know, what I have said about this is that, you know, it's like the, like the Vietnam veteran or any other veteran comes back stressed. I mean, it's very difficult to prove that you have a condition. In fact, many v uh, veterans are not certified by the VA as having any condition, and we know they have it, right? Police officers are the same thing. So, although we have been the number one um, uh, opponents of the, uh, of the police department in terms of police abuse and corruption, we're also coming out and saying these are also workers. It's really hard to separate the issues of public safety from the really systemic problems on the island that start with the economy, with economic bankruptcy. Uh, You've hit it right on the nail, and that's that's a systemic problem. It, it it permeates everything, everything, and so you can't look at the crime, uh, the the cr uh, criminality problem in Puerto Rico without going back to the budget, without going back to the fact that Puerto Rico is in bankruptcy. You can't look at the health issues that have allegedly developed since Maria, but we know were there before, um, without looking at that as well. So just about everything you can connect to this budgetary issue, to the fact that Puerto Rico is insolvent, that Puerto Rico is in bankruptcy, and has a fiscal control board that basically is going to, going to tell you what you can and cannot do. But, so bring us up to date a bit. Since the storm, what's been the impact on the rest of the justices in the courts, prisons, parole offices? Right. I mean, have they been sort of paralyzed since then, or yes. are they back to yes. work? No, well, the courts are operating... Uh, they, are, they are operating under very poor conditions. Uh, some court uh, houses still do not have electricity. Um, others have partial, right, are partially open. They were closed for a couple months. And that also was a problem because, in fact, there was just a Supreme Court decision this week where uh, the uh, district attorney's office, or what would be the district attorney's office in the states, uh, was asking the court to extend the period of time to file charges against this person who's in jail, uh, awaiting uh, charges. Uh, you have a period of six months to make sure that this person gets to the court and gets uh, some kind of hearing. That didn't, that didn't happen. Part of it is because the courts were closed and all the storm and the electricity issues. The court said, no, we're not going to extend it. It's six months. And if you didn't get it done within six months, the uh, emergency, the uh, hurricane emergency, is not a reason to violate this person's civil liberties. So all this—that so was a good decision, huh? 
all this has given you guys in the ACLU a lot more work to do. How do you yes. manage that? I mean, how, you're sitting in San Juan now, but when you go out to the mountain towns, how do you get around? What's it been like in San Juan? You can get out uh, fairly easily, but if you're traveling to the rest of the island, obviously transportation is a, is a problem. Transportation is a problem. Access to certain towns is a problem. Bridges are down. Roads are down. There are towns where people get across on a rope. Uh, which, you know, if you can imagine that. Uh, and so, yes, it's a problem. We don't go out looking for clients. Clients call us if there's an issue. So what happens is uh, many times you have NGOs on the ground that know of an issue and they contact us. Uh, we were called uh, when uh, we had an extended or uh, indefinite curfew um, uh, ordered by the governor, which we thought was very unreasonable. Uh, and we were getting calls from people because they were being stopped by police officers uh, and their civil liberties were being violated. One man in particular, a black man uh, who, and I say that deliberately, um, who was uh, at a gas station having uh, a meal because he's an electric uh, electric power worker. So he was working to reinstate the electricity and he went to have a meal. It was after six o'clock. The curfew takes place at six. He gets arrested. So the reason why I say he's a black male because the curfew, how it ended was having young or kids from certain communities most of which are black communities, which tend to be poor communities, uh, being arrested. So one of the things we've been hearing that is that uh, young people, as young as nine, in fact, have been arrested for breaking the curfew. Is there an issue there about criminalizing young people? Yeah, well, no, it's not that they necessarily have been arrested. Um, we don't know that they have, and we know young people have been arrested. Um, but of that age, we're not sure, but, but that they can be, because there's no limit on... Uh, how young that person can be to be arrested and be treated as, a, as an adult. So recently uh, a bill was proposed that would kind of institutionalize that idea that you can charge a, a minor, a youth, of any age as an adult criminal. Um, and of course we fought that. Uh, we appealed to the governor directly. Uh, other groups did the same. And the governor did not sign that, that bill. The second bill proposed a limit, which we support, but that was set at 13, which we do not support. We look more to New York's new Raise the Age Act, right, which goes into effect in 2019, that raises the age, a reasonable age for a young person to be charged as an adult. Right. So while New York did that, we're going the opposite direction here in Puerto Rico. William, again, it was fantastic to have you with us at Criminal Justice Matters. I know our viewers um, wish you and everybody in Puerto Rico the best of luck in getting through the crisis and finding a way to repair the damage that has been done to the island's infrastructure and justice system. So best of luck to you. William, thank you. Thank you. Jody Rohr is an associate professor in the Department of Latin American and Latino Latina Studies at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. She's an expert in human rights and has also researched violence against women in Puerto Rico and across the hemisphere. She joins us today with her perspective on Maria and justice. Jody, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So you were listening a bit to our conversation with William. Um, I know you go down to the island very frequently. Yes. So one of the things that we were talking about with William was the higher incidence of crime and violence that's happened. Of course, we don't really know the statistics. Nobody, which is anecdotal for the most part, and we're a criminal justice university, we deal with statistics. What's the problem with getting statistics out of the island? Yeah, so as William was saying, um, I think that the hurricane has uncovered pre-existing problems that we've had. So statistics has been an ongoing problem on the island. I actually wrote an, a law review that talks about this. Um, in particular, the issue with statistics is that we have different fountains that provide statistics and the numbers from those different fountains don't always add up. So if I could talk about my area of expertise, for yes. example, um, I work in the area of, of, of human rights and I focus my work on gender justice issues, specifically uh, domestic violence. Um, and in the area of domestic violence in Puerto Rico, uh, you'll have several areas uh, or several fountains of information or several 
um, sources where you can get information. Um, so there'll be the police department that'll have one set of statistics on domestic violence uh, crimes. You'll have what's called La Procuradora de la Mujer, which is the Women's Advocate's Office that is supposed to keep a set of, of statistics on domestic violence crimes. Um, and then you'll have um, the um, administrative office of the courts that's supposed to have another uh, group of statistics on domestic violence crimes. Often when you look at those uh, data sets, um, they don't always have the same number. And what's really important, Steve, to understand is there's no Freedom of Information Act in Puerto Rico, so you do not get information freely. You must request information. And if that information is not given to you, and which often when you do request it, it takes a long time to get it, or it's not given to you at all, you have to access it through the court system. So what do we know? Um, even anecdotally, we know there's a few websites that are actually on their own collecting information. Right, so there's this one very awesome website um, that it's just viral right now. It's been viral for some time, and it is what civil society considers a more reliable and update, accurate description of women that have disappeared, what kinds of crimes have been committed against women and girls. And it's literally an up-to-date, day-by-day social worker who compiles statistics from every single source that she can gather, whether it's news reports, and she collects and posts them on Facebook. During the hurricane, it's been very, very relevant because during the hurricane, we have had a loss of telecommunications. Yeah. Yes. And, a, and a lack of the ability to report crimes to the police because of the lack of police presence in many cases, as William has explained, and a lack of access to the court systems, right, because of the simple fact that there's been no infrastructure and there's no way for people to be able to access this because they might not have a car, uh, the streets are not, um, you're not able to access them because there's no roadways, right, to be able to get to a police uh, station, even if it was open, or a court system, a court tribunal, even if it was open because there's no electricity, right? So it's very dangerous during this period of time, even now, to travel. So one of the things that we do know is that there's been an increase in domestic violence. Absolutely. And that's directly as a result of the hurricane. Absolutely. So explain that. Why, why is that happening? Right. And, and do we know any, any, have anything close to the kind of figures that can tell us a little bit right. about the increase? Right, right, right. So there has absolutely been an increase of domestic violence with any natural disaster in any part of the world. And I'm going to focus, of course, on Puerto Rico, but I think it's important for the audience to understand that um, globally, with given, you know, um, climate change, we're going to be seeing this more increasingly, so I think the audience needs to understand that. I think as a global society and global citizens, we need to be more aware of how we can educate our communities in terms of preparing for these types of incidences. In Puerto Rico, um, the lack of electricity, the lack of access to food and water is going to exacerbate human conditions, period. There's going to be a human crisis. You're going to have PTSD, you're going to have pre-existing health conditions, mental health conditions. PTSD. Post-traumatic Post -traumatic stress, stress disorder, sorry, disorder. right? Increase in depression, for example. And the simple frustration of not being able to provide food to your children or your family or not be able to have any money to be able to access medicine, right, or buy water or buy food or be able to get to work to be able to make money. All of those things are going to exacerbate your situation. It's just going to be a chronic condition that is a result, a direct result of any natural disaster, in particular in Hurricane Irma and Maria. So that's going to escalate the incidences of domestic violence in the household. It's also going to increase um, suicide rates, right? Mm -hmm. And in the case of domestic violence, you're going to see an increase of not only domestic violence, but if you see a murder-suicide. And those are some of the situations that you'll see on this Facebook page. So let me concentrate on that. The, so that's a facet that most people, I think, don't recognize, is that domestic violence becomes a dimension of any natural catastrophe and and the reasons for it are often probably connected with the economic distress that was there to begin with and it was just exacerbated and the mental hurricane. health issues that are associated issues. with the economic distress right they're directly correlated there's no separation i mean the frustration and and of not being able to provide for your family and and the cultural connotations of what that means right in any culture this is a male dominated society in most societies around the world mm -hmm. and what does that mean and how do you um release that anger and who do you 
release that anger onto, right? And, and what are the dynamics in your household? If they already were pre-existing, it just exacerbates that. And if they weren't, it's going to maybe insinuate or create those types of situations. We know that the shelters during this period of time were full. The shelters need food, they need a generator, they need a stove, they need, these are the things. What's the physical damage? The fences are down, so we have an issue with security, right? We wanna make sure that domestic violence shelters have a fence that keeps aggressors out because often some aggressors are gonna find where the shelter is, right? And they're gonna try to invade that shelter and try to re-aggravate the victim or the victims and we wanna protect the victims that are in that shelter. So they were very vulnerable during this time and keep in mind what William said, the police w were not as present, right? So it's not like you could call the police and say, hey, the aggressor's at the door of the shelter. The shelter doesn't have a fence. We have no way to keep the aggressor out. So that was a, a breach of security was a very big concern. So what do we know about the figures or stats so far in terms right. of Right, so, so we know from September 20th to the 30th of 2017, there were 211 911 calls regarding domestic violence. We know that in October 2017, which was post Maria, there were a total of 889 wow. domestic violence calls. Right. From November 2nd um, to the 21st of 2017, there were 647 calls. So from September to November 2017, there were a total of 1,747 calls. Astronomical number of domestic Absolutely. violence calls. So the issue of gathering data during that period of time of October to the end of November has been very difficult. How do we get an accurate number? Were the police so under resourced and were they doing an effective job at recording it is questionable because before the hurricane we know that we had problems with them collecting accurate mm -hmm. data anyway. Um, is this an underreported number because people didn't have access to cell phones and weren't able to get through anyway? So police are just beginning to deal with the issue of domestic violence on the mainland. You're, you've been working in this issue in all parts of the world, all parts of the hemisphere. What's needed for a justice system and a police system to be able to cope with that? Just very quickly. So, you know. so we've been working on, I've been working on this for two decades, and this is a common no, question, gonna, right? Gonna, we're not going to sum it up seconds. very quickly. But we know that we need training. One of the issues is, and we know that the reform process that William and other organizations in the island have been working so hard for is inclusive of this. And actually, the ACLU of Puerto Rico has a women's project that works to teach the community about what the reform has in terms of the protocol for domestic violence. So they actually go out into the communities to train the community. The ACLU has a, a program that does this to say this is what your rights are under the reform um, and to create awareness in the community about what their rights are under the reform. Whether or not the police do that is a different story. Um, I've been meeting with the police and saying, what is the training for domestic violence? Could we work on this? How much training do police officers receive? And it's very, very small. Um, you know, some estimates have been 30 minutes to an hour, three hours. It's, it's, it's been a very inconclusive number. Um, so I think educating police officers on proper um, training of how to handle domestic violence cases and more cultural awareness and education in the um, elementary school through K through 12 system is a really good way to start. Jody, we'll have to have you back again to talk more about this, but thank you so much. Thank you. Really thank you for having pleasure me. Pleasure talking to you. Thank you. If you are wondering what a hurricane has to do with criminal justice, I hope today's program will make the link clear. In fact, as we face what experts suggest will be even more serious weather catastrophes in coming years, aggravated by climate change, Puerto Rico's story should be a wake-up call. Preparing a justice system to cope with the impact of a natural disaster should be as high on the agenda of our leaders as rebuilding homes and getting the lights back on. Maybe it's time to ask your representatives if they share that concern, and if not, why not? Let me know what you think. I'm Steve Handelman. Thanks for watching. See you next time.